Hey all, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host. Today I'm going to have a special guest, Mr. Kevin Sandridge of the Barbecue Beat Podcast and Blog. I'll be right back with Kevin Sandridge. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter, sous vide and chilling from fire and water. Hey all, I want to welcome back Inkbird Products as a sponsor of the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. Inkbird makes one of the best Wi-Fi 4 Pro barbecue thermometers that I've ever seen out there. The IBBQ4T is 100% rechargeable USB 4 Pro Wi-Fi enabled barbecue thermometer. And it usually sells for under $100. Check it out the link below for the Inkbird Wi-Fi IBBQ 4T 4 Pro Barbecue Thermometer. Welcome back, Inkbird Products. Welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren. I'm your host. And today I have a really great guest, one that I've been wanting to get on for a while. I have Mr. Kevin Sandridge of the Barbecue Beat Blog and Podcast. Kevin's been doing his uh, Barbecue Beat Blog and Podcast for a long time now. Uh, Kevin, welcome. Thanks for being on. And go ahead and introduce yourself and tell me all about you. Oh, thank you so much, Darren. I can't thank you enough, actually. And it's, uh, guys, I want to put this out there. Darren and I are, are not geographically far from one another. And so hopefully that means once all this crazy Corona stuff stops, we can actually get together and do some cooking. And that will be, that'll be very, very enjoyable. But yeah, I, um, I started the, the Barbecue Beat uh, blog know, four or five years ago and then morphed it into more of a podcast effort and uh, just really use it as a platform to interact with people who I'm interested in learning more about, seeking to sort of broaden the scope a little bit. Um, you know, barbecue means a lot of things to a lot of different people. It could be hot and fast. It could be low and slow. It can be any kind of grilling, really, depending on where you're coming from. And so I go everywhere from competition barbecue stuff all the way to one of my favorite episodes, which was uh, talking with John Jackson out of uh, Milledgeville, Georgia. And John runs Comfort Farms, which is a, an acute crisis center for veterans based on the model of farming, getting veterans who are struggling with uh, some you know, PTSD issues and, and associated sort of after effects of being deployed and letting them be mission-centric and oriented with, with farming, right? Because there's no day off with farming. And so um, that's really, I mean, my purpose is to just get the stories down and talk with people and, and do my little bit to help spread the good news of what's going on with, with any kind of, you know, live fire cooking or anything associated with it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's similar to me when I, when I started putting my whole uh, fire and water cooking thing together, I started out with a Facebook group and just trying to, you know, teach people what I've been learning and, and kind of spread and help you know, centralize the information so people could find it easier. And it looks like that's what you started out with. And I'm going to kind of go to your blog here so people can see it and um, find it. But this is your um, barbecue beat website. And I guess you kind of, like you said, you started out as a blog. What got you interested in, um, in barbecue? I mean, did you start out as a competition cook? Did you just start out as a fan of, competitions did you you know uh, happen to just watch the uh, barbecue pitmasters and then get excited about it or uh, a lot of people have i mean that's that's uh... oh yeah absolutely i mean barbecue pitmasters launched a lot of competition barbecue teams uh some some of those are are still killing it out there you know today or at least you know as recently as we've had our, our last round of, of competitions but yeah, for me it's been more of a, a fan boy experience you know a little bit of a barbecue um, groupie. I, I wanted to up my own cooking skills and my own game when it came to barbecue. And, and then I reached out to some local folks here as I started out. Chad Ward with Whiskey Bent Barbecue. He and his team were on the amateur side of things. I went out to an event in Bartow. I think it was the barbecue, Bartow Barbecue and Bluegrass Festival. That was a great event. You know, they were real kind and, and, and brought me into their camp and showed me around, kind of gave me a behind the scenes look at how they prep their proteins and some of the 
ingredients they use. That, that was my first introduction to to the combination of uh, Blues Hog Original and Blues Hog Tennessee Red as a kind of a go-to competition sauce mixture. And uh, and we got into you know a situation where from there we we just broaden the circle, right? I got to know more teams, I got to sort of, you know, spread my interest levels out to different areas and, and just, you know, moved on into the blog experience. You know, anyone who's ever operated a blog knows that it can be quite time consuming. Um, you know, and, and you can only really write so many, you know, top 10 barbecue sauces or, you know, like, you know, the, yeah, the, click, exactly. the clickbait kind of stuff. And I just like, ugh, I just, my heart wasn't in it. And I thought, what do I like to do? Well, I like to, I like to talk is what I like to do. Right. Um, so I just started using that mindset and, and, as a, and morphing it into the podcast platform as a way to, to keep information coming into my sort of barbecue beat presence, but also to make sure that I am constantly trying to do what I can to, to, to give back. I mean, a, a lot of the people involved with barbecue, you know, they're, they're, they support a lot of charity work. They do, a, they give of themselves a lot. You've got Operation Barbecue Relief. There's just so many avenues where, you know, I think, I think people take for granted that barbecue is going to be there, especially when times are down and it's, you know, I don't think I have to tell you any restaurant operation operates on a thin margin. If you want to see paper, rice paper, thin margins, go talk to a barbecue restaurant, right? Especially one that's trying to do things, you know, kind of with like, you know, wood smoke only, you no know, gas assist, just trying to like keep things as authentic as possible. Um, one of the best in Central Florida. If you haven't been out there, uh, I recommend everyone head out to see what uh, Chad and Amy Kreiderman are doing at Kreiderman's Barbecue in Cocoa, Florida. They also have a Melbourne, Florida location. Two massive offset, you know, Texas style sort of propane tank smokers. I think they're like, I want to say they're at least a thousand gallons each. And, uh, and they're, they're doing great work, um, but it's not easy. And they have to cultivate a staff that knows what they're doing and keep things going. And, and so, yeah, like, so, so that's really been it for the most part. I started as a fan of competition barbecue and then i got to a point where how many times can we hear i didn't want every podcast episode to be the how do you cook your four meats for competitions you right. know what i mean because exactly yeah there's a <laughs> lot of repetition there i mean obviously you know there are nuanced differences that that earn grand champions for some and and mid-pack wards for for others but, uh, but yeah, so just to keep it a little bit fresh and interesting, I try to branch it out as much as I can. And that's kind of like with me, I, I like, I love barbecue. That's one of my first loves. I've been cooking it for a long time. I never competed or anything like that, but I love watching, you know, going to the com competitions and watching them on, you know, watching barbecue pit masters and, and reading and, and, and trying out stuff in my backyard as well. Um, but I also love to I'm a overall cook. I like to cook different things. That's why I, I kind of started this mixing it with sous vide and kind of trying to show people mm -hmm. that they can, they don't have to do what, you know, uh, that they see on a barbecue pit masters, you know, they, right. they, you know, Johnny Triggs ribs for competition are not something you want to eat every day because oh. they're made for one bite and people, yeah. Yeah. people don't understand that a lot of the times. And, yeah. You know, whenever I have, you know, one of the big competitors, like when I had Malcolm on and when I had mm -hmm. Meathead or some of these others that have been in the competition side for a while, you know, they're the first to tell you that, you know, that's not what you want to cook in your backyard is what you see. They well, it's not what they cook in their backyard. Exactly. The yeah. It's uh, eating barbecue and competition barbecue are totally different. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think people get their, you know don't really realize that until you kind of tell them. And that's one of the things I like too, is that, you know, people, I see you can watch a lot of YouTube channels and people, you know, tell you what they really do. But then again, they're not, they're going to hold back some because they don't want to put their, <laughs> what everything that they do, they'll tell, you know, it's like uh, Harry Sue. I, I like, I like to watch a lot of his videos and I've had him on the podcast before too. He's and he'll tell you 99% of what he does, but there's that 1% yeah. he holds back for, competitors when he's in the competition you know or everybody well, would be doing it doing it so yeah well and and even 
even when you take classes and you're paying seven, 800 bucks to sit for two days and learn from someone, you know, I, one of the best classes I ever went to was um, at the, the whiskey bent location the when it was on South Florida Avenue, whiskey bent barbecue. Um, Heath Riles was there from Heath Riles barbecue, formerly of victory lane barbecue, formerly of Boar's night out barbecue. Um, one of the, winningest barbecue champions there is today. I mean, this is a guy that'll roll up to the Murfreesboro 17th street event, which is a combination KCBS and Memphis barbecue network event and win grand champion in both that weekend. Mm -hmm. He's laying out his entire program in that class in a way that he, he literally is holding nothing back. And when he, and he says it to the class and I, I believe him when he says it, the trick is execution, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, can you, can you do everything? It's, it's like, it's like people who are, are starting to learn how to um, handle, you know, handguns, right? It, or even it, drive it, a car <laughs> or drive a car, like situations where you are in a controlled environment is one thing situations where stuff's going sideways and you got to figure it out on the fly. Oh, come on now. That's a whole other deal. Right. And so that's what Heath will tell you. It's like, if you can roll up to me cooking my program side by side and on a given weekend and beat me, go for it, man. I'm going to give you everything I got. I'm going to show you what I do, but, but that's just it, man. Like, you know, temps are going to spike. Something's going to go in a way that you don't expect you're going to have to compensate and you know triage is everything and and how good are you when when the chips are down right and that's when it you know it, you and i both have had podcast episodes where we're recording with someone and all of a sudden something fritzes out and we gotta or oh, right yeah. before we're getting ready and like, oh man and you better have two or three options right because yeah. some and again i we, we were just speaking about this like some guests you get one shot yeah right and it's super awkward to try to ask for a redo. Yeah. So, yeah. Or, you know, you, uh, that's why I don't like doing live podcasts. I know that, uh, you know, the barbecue central, you know, Greg likes <laughs> Greg. to do his, he likes to do his live, but I, you know, he's been doing it for almost 12 years. Greg's now. a pro. Like he's, he's and, a G man. He's yeah. <laughs> but OG I can't, I can't barbecue. That, you know? That's right. It's um, cool. a lot of things. And I, and I'm going back to the barbecue stuff, but even when yeah. I talk to Harry Sue and Malcolm, it's, uh, you know, everybody is all about the, you know, sometimes it's, you know, what, what equipment do you use and what yeah. spices and this do you use? And, you know, even Harry says, it's not about that stuff. It's not about the equipment or the seasonings. I mean, there's some, they play some role, but 90% of it is who's doing it. And then yeah. the experience yeah. they have and the ability, like you said, to pull stuff out of the fire and, you know, something you know they drop their chicken on the ground you know on the way to the judging <laughs> you know what are they going to do now you know yeah. so pulling it out yeah of like one of the one of the coolest things i learned was like if you overshoot so like you know on the the money muscle part of a pork butt where they're trying to cut those little medallion slices off right. opposite where the bone is well if it gets overcooked it gets a little mushy one of the things that they'll do is they'll they'll separate it wrap it real tight in a saran wrap put it in a Ziploc bag and plunge it in some ice water and a yeah, cooler make to it tighten it up. Yeah. Like I never would have thought to do that. Right. I would have turned in fall apart, mushy money muscle. <laughs> that's how it would have gone down. And yeah. a lot of people do. That's why, but yeah. that's why these guys are, you know, winners because they've been yeah. doing it for years, but yeah. the guy walking in off the street on his first or second or third competition sometimes hasn't learned those secrets yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you have the, you know, the IBCA guys down in Texas, right? Like that's all that barbecue will sit around for a long time. The episode I did with Aaron Leslie of, uh, you know, out, out of Texas, he, I mean, he talked about, you know, your, your chicken or your ribs or your brisket, it's going to be sitting around for an hour or two while it goes through the judging paces. And you almost want to overcook your stuff mm -hmm. because as it cools, it's going to tighten up a little bit and just, Again, like if you're if you're not learning those tips and those secrets from people, you're kind of out of luck when it comes to trying to go for it yourself in the first go. But yeah. Now, have you competed much yourself at all? Only as an assistant. Like okay. I don't have a team. Um, 
in recent memory, there was a bit of a gauntlet I ran one weekend. Matt Barber down here out of Bartow, Florida with Hot Guachulas, uh, you know, champion barbecue pit master. We had a, an FBA, Florida Barbecue Association event on a Saturday in um, Davenport, Florida. And then right down the road, down 27 in, um, I want to say, I think it was uh, Frostproof. There was a KCBS competition on Sunday. So I helped him that weekend. And I mean, I, I, I basically cleaned stuff as fast as I possibly could and got out of the way a lot is what really went down. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, like I, I was not going to, I mean, I was happy. I didn't do anything that jeopardized him. He, I think he placed in the top 10 in, uh, the FBA event. He won grand champion in the KCBS event. So I was like, all right, not, I didn't had nothing to do with that win, but I didn't detract from it either. So yeah. that well, was you good. helped. You stayed out of his way. So you helped that's right. you, you that's clean right. stuff. So yes. that's important, you know, cleaning. There's up a stuff. word for my role, but I won't say it on the air. So yeah. <laughs> Grunt. You were a grunt. Yeah, that's go. right. That's right. Much better. Yeah. Now, do you get to do you get to go out to? Do you travel around? Did you go to like to the one in Lakeland here um, that happened? You know, right before everything went to hell, <laughs> the, the the one that was here at the uh, Lakeland Linder Airport. Yeah, Pig Fest every year is a great yeah. one. I try to get to that every year. Um, they used to have another one. Uh, years past, it was like Pigs Fly South, uh, I think in December. That was a trick to have one in December and then. But that was back when the Lakeland Pig Fest was happening at the uh, Tiger Stadium, Joker Marchant up uh, North Lakeland. But um, yeah, that's a great event. Um, it's always nice because you get to see people from outside the state to kind of roll in for that. And um, and I have done like. There aren't, there's only a handful, five or six, if you're lucky in a given year of uh, the KCBS events every year. And so if you want to, I wanted to hit my milestone as a judge, as a master judge for both the Florida Barbecue Association and KCBS. Well, to do it in KCBS, if you don't want to take forever, you have to go outside the state, um, like to Georgia. You know, I've been up to uh, North Carolina. I've done events, uh, the great Colorado state championship they have every year in Frisco. It's about 10,000 miles up in the mountains. It's in the area where like Breckenridge and all the ski resorts and stuff are, you know, that's, that's a great event. Um, so yeah, it's been nice to travel a little bit um, and not just for competitions. Um, again, I mentioned Comfort Farms every year in January they do a traditional sort of taking down of some of the animals that they raised. And um, it's called a boucherie event. You may have heard of that term before, uh, but it's, it's a great event. It, it really um, puts the context of where your food comes from forefront. And again, it's, it's heavily, you know, attended and, and operated by veterans, which is nice. And then area chefs from Atlanta, really high end folks come in and, and they're all cooking over live fire. It's a great event. Um, I highly recommend you guys, once we can get to where we're doing this stuff again, check it out. Because not only is it for a good cause, but it really leaves you, I think, with a deeper appreciation of what it takes to put food on the table, too. So, Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, I think you know, I, I grew up on a farm for a little while when I uh, was younger in upstate New York. So um, like you said before that, you know, when you're on a farm, there's no days off. There's no, um, you know, I, I'll sleep until 10 o'clock. I mean, you're up at five o'clock in the morning, if not earlier, right. you know, you know, you know, doing something, you're, you know, milking the cows or you're chasing the chickens around, you're feeding the pigs or, you know, and if you happen to be growing, you know, growing crops, you're out there, mm -hmm. you know, fertilize and water and you're, you're, you're doing something all the time. I mean, there's always something that you have to do. So yes, sir. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, as easy as people think, you know, <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, absolutely. But knowing where your food comes from is definitely a big deal. And uh, yeah, that's why you know, I actually, every once in a while, I'll, I have a buddy of mine who raises cattle here locally and uh, at least once a year, I'll buy, you know, a cow from them and just, nice. um, you know, I got a big freezer in my garage and, you know, I, Buy it directly from him because I know where it came from. I know how yep. it was raised. You know, I know that um, you know it's not any. It's not cheaper than buying it at the grocery no. store by any no. means because you know they the way they raise their cows is just in a big mill. You know, but uh, I feel a lot better getting it from somebody like that for sure. So well, and and you're contributing directly to his 
ability to, to sustain that operation, which I'm sure he exactly. appreciates. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's definitely, like I said, I know where it came from. I know it's fresh. I know he didn't, you know, use any weird chemicals or hormones or anything that he's not supposed to be doing. So it's, uh, always, uh, good to know where your food comes from for sure. Absolutely. So what have you learned over the years? I mean, I know that's probably a hard question. You'd probably fill up, you know, five or six episodes of that, but what are like some of the top five things that you learned over the years about competition cooks and barbecue competitions in general that people might not know from watching, you know, barbecue pit masters and all that? Well, right off the gate, one of the things you touched on, Darren, is you mentioned Harry Sue. Harry Sue won grand championships on a regular basis cooking out of two Weber Smoky Mountain cookers, right? I mean, these are sub $300 or right at these days cookers. They are not, they're not the sexiest thing on the market. They're not these big gravity-fed units that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, and I, I, I don't even know if he had much in the way of a trailer. I think it was a vehicle and maybe some pop-up tents and, and he was just killing it. And, you know, starting, starting out of the gates, it's kind of the same advice that, that Aaron Franklin gives people when they want to maybe start a restaurant venture. You know, he was really purposeful in starting out with as little debt as possible. Like don't, don't think you need a Langs or a, not a, not a Lang, but a, a you know, a, a well, well, even a laying smoker. I mean, you can start out with, um, you know, the Weber Smoky Mountains. You don't need to go out and spend big bucks to compete. And, you know, really, another thing is, I believe more competition cooks that want to get better should judge more. You know, take the class, but but that's not the end. That's actually the beginning because. You know, the class is, again, it's a controlled environment. What you want to do is get into multiple judging environments as a competitor, and you want to make sure that you are listening to what the judges are talking about. You, know, you can pick up on trends, things that they'll always say, oh, well, you know, I knew this entry was going to be bad right when I looked at it. And I'm not saying that's a fair approach as a judge, but it's the kind of stuff that happens with judges sometimes. And you start to learn how, again, to – to plan your cooking profile and program around what judges are going to experience, but you don't know that until you're back there talking with more judges, you know, you know, on the flip side of that real quick, if I may, I would argue that more judges need to get out and talk with more teams. What happens is a judging event is over and they go home. So, you know, they get there at nine 30, 10 o'clock in the morning, things start, they're done by one 30, two o'clock and then they jet. And, what a missed opportunity, right? To, you could go out and, and teams are super friendly. They're, I mean, almost, I, I can't even count the times, so maybe once or twice where it seemed like a team wasn't really interested in, in talking, but they're appreciative of the fact that you as a judge want to learn more and they will, they will talk with you and you can really, I don't know, I think deepen your appreciation for competition barbecue and your enjoyment of the events you go to. So um, as far as, you know, meats are concerned, you can do well in chicken, ribs, and pork without breaking the bank. Unfortunately, when it comes to brisket, so many people have been cooking the higher end prime wagyu, plus yeah. wagyu a9 yeah stuff that that it's it's sort of started to shape the mindset of the judges i think when they're when they're sitting in there and tasting the brisket that comes through and and if anyone's ever tasted competition brisket it's it's not anything at all like what you may have had at like a traditional Texas style brisket right. restaurant, like not even close. And, 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 and that's fine. It is what it is. And, and competitors will tell you that they're not cooking you their favorite recipes. They're cooking what they think the judges have been conditioned to like. And, right. uh, and it's, it's sort of a chess match. It's more of a game. It's not, Hey, let's cook the best barbecue. It's let's cook the best barbecue that the judges are expecting to eat. Well, and like, you know, I said about, you know, with Johnny Triggs ribs, it's that one bite, you know, you want to, you don't have a whole, 
you know, rack of ribs to, you know, get their interest. It's that one bite they're taking because right. they're going to take a bite of everything. So they're, yeah. they're taking that one bite. They're, they're judging everything they can on that one bite. That's why you see, you know, when somebody's doing a, a competition brisket, they got all sorts of injections they're doing. They're, they're making sure, you know, they're patting the, you know, putting the rub on just right, making sure they trim it perfectly. I mean, you, you sit there and watch, you know, trim a brisket and throw out half the meat and you're like, holy cow, what are you doing? <laughs> it's a Wagyu, like you said, it's a Snake yeah. River Farms, you know, gold Wagyu that cost them 250 bucks. And yeah, like, they're using terms like aerodynamic, you know, yeah. shaping, like, and it's <clears> like right. you, they're trying to launch an airplane here. It's like, it's and, crazy. Yeah, it's, um, so it's definitely a, a different ballpark than what most yeah. people would actually cook in their backyard. But um, what, what do you think about um, with like competitions, if they did something like what the, the SCA does, where the S, where the, they actually provide the meat and everybody's on an even keel? you know because that's what happens with the steak cook-offs they provide the ribeye steaks so you know everybody has yep they they pull from the pile they, they have to draw their you know numbers and everything so they get yeah. to pick but still they're not having to be able to bring in a gold wagyu and then, then somebody stuck with a prime you know because that's all you can afford <laughs> or, the, or the walmart select the, the excel yeah. walmart the, the no select, roll from yeah, yeah, GFS, yeah. you know yeah um I love it. I love the idea. I, I wish we could find a way to make it happen more often. Um, Sterling Ball with Big Papa Smokers has run guinea pig events. He calls them for several years, and that's what he does. You sign up. Typically, um, they, they can range. Some of them, I think, are more – they might be a little more invite-only, but others are open to whoever wants to sign up, and your fee covers the meats, and you are operating on more of a level playing field. Um, yeah, I, I I like that idea. Um, I've heard something even more extreme. I was talking with a guy um, out of Tasmania, um, and his name is Rowan, and and he at the time was involved with the Tasmanian Barbecue Association, and they did an event where I don't know maybe there's fifteen or twenty individuals who are going to be cooking this event and the way they worked it is there were however many number of competitors there there was an equal number of different kinds of smokers grills and cookers like no one grill smoker or cooker was like any other one there mm -hmm. so we're talking little electric smokers all the way up to offset smokers that are wood burning only right and what you did was as a competitor you drew a number out of a hat and that number corresponded with a certain cooker and you had to be ready to cook your <laughs> proteins on the number you drew. And I think to be fair, they, they gave the worst cuts to the person that ended up with like the best cooker, you know? <laughs> wow. um, but uh, everyone was more or less cooking the same proteins, but they were having to figure out possibly a, a way of cooking that they weren't familiar with. Right. It sounds like a chopped episode or something. A little bit. It's like you're pulling your cooker out of the basket instead of just the protein. You know? <laughs> right. That'd be yeah, that'd be kind of fun though. I mean I mean that's uh, that's I I refuse to ever wear any kind of clothing item that says pitmaster on it because I'm not one. I know what it takes to really in my mind wear that that badge of honor, so to speak, with some legitimacy and I'm not there. Uh an event like that I just described to you. If you can win one of those, yeah, you get to wear that. You get to tattoo that on your body. Yeah, right. yeah. That's crazy. What do you think of, um, you know, getting back to um, the judging, you know, because you, you, you've said you've been a judge for a while for both KCBS and the regional events and, and stuff like that. And, and I know I've talked to, um, you know, the, the guy from the SCA as well. And then, you know, Brett Galloway. Yeah, Brett. And he yeah. was on that show. And, we kind of talked about the judging of the state competitions because they, it seems they get kind of locked into a, in, into like a body, they, they get tied up into some of these things. Like we talked about the, uh, you know, using the grill grates to get the uh, grill marks, you know, that, that is such a big deal that um, on the state cook-off competition is the grill marks. It doesn't really mean that it's always going to be the best tasting steak, but it's such a big thing that it's, you know, if you don't, 
you know, cook it on a PK yeah. grill on gr with, yeah. in, with grill grates, you probably at least gonna... use grill grates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's formulaic. Right. And it, and, and like anything, I mean, look, look at, to some extent, I don't know if you could put this to the test with any other kind of competition event, maybe even like auto racing, right? Like at some point, a lot of the vehicles are going to start looking like a lot of the other vehicles because those are the their dynamics and the weight ratios that are winning and the pack just sort of gravitates to that, that style or that, that method of, you know, of cooking in the case of SCA. And I mean, yes, me, I, I'm a, I, I am a cast iron skillet steak guy all day long. I want the browning to be that, that my artifact to be across the whole surface of the steak. Grill marks are pretty, but I'm greedy. I want more of that flavor everywhere. Right. right? That, and that's so me too, but that's not going to win you an event at SEA. Right. And that's, and it, you know, because they take aesthetics into it, you know, they do. It's, and it's, it's, a, it's should, a big part of it. Now, but getting back to you being a judge and you, okay. you, you know, attending a lot of these competitions and you got mm -hmm. some high caliber guys at all of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, I mean, you've got to be sitting there one and tasting this one brisket and then you taste the next one. How do you differentiate? It's a fine line sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, mean, it's, it's gotta be because, you know, a lot of these guys are using the same injections or using the same different kind mm -hmm. of rub, you know, mixtures. And, you know, how, I mean, how, where, the tiebreaker for me, all honestly, Darren, the tiebreaker for me always is tenderness right um you're gonna have entries that have a similar flavor to them perhaps but you know and i i i have had times look i mean you're not limited in, in fba or kcbs judging to only one perfect score across the board like if i've had cases where the chicken entries come through and out of the five or six entries we're presented with two of them got tens for me top scores for me let's say tens in fba nines in case bs um on taste tenderness and presentation you know they were just i i they weren't maybe the exact same but they they did well in my mind in all categories and um and i think that's that's one of the things that i think people run into a, a problem with is that sometimes especially new judges you know they tend to score very low and they it's like they're reserving that 10 for the, the the entry that's going to make them feel like they've just entered some you know <laughs> ethereal plane of existence right right yeah and it's it's just yeah it's again i think talk understanding more about the process helps um, how the food is being prepared, the timelines involved, and, you know, are they hitting the mark? Again, tenderness for me always wins. And I think guys like, you know, Iowa Smokey D's, Darren Worth, you know, he'll tell you that, you know, he wins like he wins because he's got tenderness down. You know, he, the flavor, as, as long as the flavor of the barbecue is is not offensive <laughs> not off putting there's not yeah i mean as long as there's not one component like it's not too spicy it's not too sweet it's not too as long as it's like yeah. the best average barbecue you can cook if you yeah. nail tenderness you're gonna do well um and i will say this fba has a judging system that goes to 10 and it goes in five point increments which makes it nice in those cases where you're like man i don't want to give it a nine but i can't quite give it a 10 9.5 it is you know what i mean yeah. it, it seems like well, how would you how would you possibly know if it's a decimal a, a, a 0.5 you know degrees of, of difference but that's why it's there because yeah. you don't want to take them down a whole level so yeah, yeah like how that. long how long did it take you to get your judging uh chops down i mean i know when you your first one your first event you're definitely not an expert and and like you said you're you know, talking to the other judges to kind of get their experience mm -hmm. and you're going out and talking to some of the competitors that have been doing it a while. How long does it usually take for somebody who just starts judging to be able to say, I'm a good judge now? I was probably a good 10 events in before I started to feel like I'm, I'm getting to feel for this, right? Like, you know, and it, and I think that's important. You just kind of let it come to you and you, you 
you get used to what other people are 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 saying you understand like what to look for again you i i made it a habit of taking some barbecue classes myself some competition classes so i understood you know where the cooks were coming from how that met with the uh, the regulations you know the, they say that a rib should you know when you bite into the side of a rib it should leave a sort of rounded you know bite mark and the bone should quickly turn sort of dry from air exposure you know and there shouldn't be a lot of like moist like it's, the meat shouldn't slide off the bone and so on and so forth i mean you, you start there and then you just kind of do your best to try to make sure you're always adhering to those um those parameters now if i bite into a a and I, but i try to i try to give teams two chances on ribs i'll take a bite from each side of the rib right Mm-hmm. if there's meat enough on each side, sometimes they cut them where the meat's sitting on top of the rib, even with this, a, a, like a St. Louis spare and they cut the sides pretty thin. So in that case, it's a little tricky, but I still try to, I try to, to act as much in good faith as I can. And, and, and if there's an error on the side of anything, it's on the side of the team, right? If I'm not sure to give them a, in KCBS, a nine or an eight, and I really can't make up my mind and I'm torn, I'm going to give them the nine. You know what I mean? Because yeah. why, why, why shoot to the negative if, right. if I couldn't make the decision? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great. Well, I'm glad uh, we talked about that. I mean, I wasn't expecting to, to spend a lot of time on that, but uh, it's always interesting to get somebody's perspective that's been a judge for a while because, I, I, like I said, I've been to a lot of, you know, competition barbecues, and one of the things that also gets me is how much they actually, you know, selling the barbecue to – the spectators is part of it, you know, where, you know, you go there on a Friday, like, you know, we went to Lakeland, we went to Friday and everybody's just selling barbecue. Yeah. They're, they're, they're doing the ancillary little comp- competitions, you know, the, you know, side dishes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, comp- you know, they got two or three guys working those, but they're busting their butt selling barbecue Uh-oh. to the public. So yeah. Yeah. And, and there will be big events like Lakeland pig fest or any of the really big name events. I, I would I would say okay like you, you're good you're gonna get some good food as an audience attendee as a, um, the smaller events honestly man I tell friends of mine look let me know if you're coming because then I'll get some of the competitors to set some stuff aside that you can buy from them because some of the vended products that you can yeah. buy it's not that great and yeah. I, I wouldn't get it myself so yeah. Let's let that walks into something else. So do you like to cook your own barbecue? Do you go out to eat barbecue? Um, I know, you know, some people that have restaurants and stuff you probably go to, but let's say, do I see you at mission barbecue every once in a while or Sonny's or. <laughs> I've never been to mission. I, I grew up with Sonny's. I, I'm a Sonny's kid. I, I think Sonny's hit a low point in the late eighties, early nineties, where they were cooking everything out of sort of a cafeteria and sort of shipping it out in bags. Um, Brian Morosco with actually with the uh, bull rush barbecue here, um, took over their barbecue operations some time ago and got them cooking fresh every day again. And, you know, it's when you're looking at the kind of volume that, that they have to contend with, as far as, you know, when people are full on going out to restaurants, it's tough to keep everything at a really high level, but, but I think they do a pretty good job and it's, it's a fair price for a, a good meal. And so I'm, I'm always going to fly the Sunny's flag. Um, if I'm, if I haven't had barbecue in a little while at a restaurant and, and I'm probably not going to go to just any barbecue place. Like I said, Sunny's that's, they, they have a special like, you know, hometown feel for me, but the other place, um, let's see, you've got Polk City Barbecue uh, run by Joel Van. They do a great job. Um, I would go there anytime. I recommend friends to go there anytime. Not only will they do a good job for you, if anything ever goes in a way that you don't like, like you don't enjoy your meal, they'll go above and beyond and make sure it's right either that visit or the next time. So you can't ask more than that. And then I, I mentioned Kreiderman's uh, as far as like on the – on the uh, sort of uh, Atlantic coast, you know, Chad and Amy, those guys are doing great. Um, but other than that, I'd rather just cook it myself than eat 
meh barbecue, you know, because I know I can do a, a, a pretty good job. And if I mess it up, that's one thing. If I'm paying someone money and they mess it up, uh, it's going to go over a little worse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm the same way. I've been to Mission. and Mission's not bad, but one of the things I don't like going and spending $19 on a sampler plate that, you know, they just give you a little splotch of everything. And then, you know, you're still hungry after you're done and you just drop 20 bucks. And yeah, yeah, know. that's, and that's, I mean, but that's the thing you go out to Cryerman's and get a sampler plate. You're going to drop 50 bucks. Yeah. But because, then again, you, you can't get a wallow out of there. I'm sure. But, too. but, and, and the quality is better yeah. up here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you just, that's not every day, you know, every week even like, and, and it's, someone told me once, like, the way to judge barbecue or any food really, but at a restaurant is how far would you drive to eat it? Mm -hmm. Like, would you drive 50 miles to eat that barbecue? You know, mm -hmm. if the answer is yes, it's probably pretty okay. Yeah. And I would, I'd drive the hour and a half plus to, to Criderman's anytime. So. And do you put your judging goggles on when you go out or? Do you, no, because it's a different deal, right? Yeah. Like now, now I am, I am critical, you know, I pay, pay the money. So I'm like, so I, uh, I will tell you and Chad will tell you like their sausage two years ago had a little bit too much of a crumble to it. When you bet through the casing and they make their own, you know, beef sausage, maybe it's got a little pork in there too. Um, but it wasn't, I don't know. The binder wasn't quite right. And he'll tell you, he's like, he did research. And it, now when you go, in my opinion, it's a much better product. Right. And, and I, and I give him honest feedback and that's all you can do. You're not, you don't have to be a jerk about it. You know, you're right. like, yeah. Hey man, like I really enjoyed this and this, I did find this. Like, I don't know if it was an off day. He's like, yeah, we're working on that. We're trying to get, and that's just it, man. Like I think talking to like, if you're at a place where you can actually talk to the people doing the cooking, especially if it's a, a more of a, a you know, I guess they call it like craft or artisanal or like, you know, they're trying to do things in a, in a, in a sort of from scratch mindset. Mm -hmm. They appreciate the honest feedback. Right. right. And I think that's uh, you never have to be as a guest at a restaurant like that, ashamed of letting them know. I think they want the feedback because no one. Yeah. yeah but like you said, it's the way they do it. You do it too. You don't go, ah, you know, you don't be a Karen yeah, and yell like at them. Don't, don't go on Yelp and start screaming about how you hated the food. That right. does, that's just not a good look. Like, go, <laughs> yeah. be an adult. Go talk to the people with your actual words. You know, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I, wor I worked in restaurants my first uh, probably 15 years in, uh, okay, in so working. So, you know, until I was up to like 25 or so, I worked yeah. in restaurants. So, you know, I know how. You it, know the deal. When you're back there and cooking, and you're like, like you said, it's like when you're selling barbecue at the competitions, they're, they're just flinging stuff out there. It ain't yeah. what they're doing that, you know, taking to the judges in little boxes, they're flinging it right. out there. And sometimes you get a good one. Sometimes you get a bad one and you're just trying to get as many out as you can. So it's a little bit different when you're under pressure. So, so that's definitely a, a thing. So what do you think, um, kind of get towards the end here, but I want to talk to you about, we talked about, um, barbecue pit masters before and how that kind of changed the way people looked at their backyards and barbecue and got a lot more people involved and excited and, and not just barbecue pit masters, but even mix that in with chopped and some of the, you know, the food network shows yeah. and Emerald yeah. Lagasse and, and all that. Um, it, cooking overall, people have gotten a lot more interested in it, you know, with all these TV shows and how do you think that's changed how people look at their backyard or, or cooking outdoors anymore? Um, I think there's been a little bit of a renaissance, man. Like if you look post-World War II, you know, a lot of GIs coming home, like hasty baked grills, you know, they came about because there was a desire by their founder to, you know, as, when he was away fighting to come back home and, and, and be able to, to have the kind of barbecue he had been dreaming about eating again and, and formulating a plan to, to make a product that's going to allow the family to gather together and cook and enjoy uh, their products. I mean, Weber started out the same way. And, you know, I think over time, 
you know, especially through the 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 eighties, like the, the late seventies, early eighties, we we went into the the TV the hardcore presence of a shift between like, you know, the TV dinner to the microwave dinner, you know. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, and like fast and food, get, McDonald's yeah, oh, burgers, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And 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 go, Bucket go, go. Chicken. And yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> and um, you know, I will still contend, by the way, that although probably much less healthy for you, McDonald's fries in 1980 were way better than they are today. Um, <laughs> I still love them. They're fine. They have their place. But anyway, I digress. Uh, but I will say that I think people are getting into um, doing more themselves. It's just like everything else, like DIY everything, right? Home and garden television, like the whole deal. Um, I, will, I will be very honest. I've gone much further in trying to cook barbecue for myself than I have been trying to uh, up my handyman home repair skills. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I tell my <laughs> wife, I am not a handyman. Every just, time she says, can you fix that? I'm like, no, that's why we call people and pay them. That's why we have a phone. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> that's funny. That guy, um, we got to give that guy some work so he can feed right. his family. That's right. We're, we're helping the economy here. Um, right. But yeah, it's a, it's a deal where I think people are really trying to, um, maybe also purposely slow down in their hectic lives. And I think cooking helps you do that when you want to do it through a process that requires steps that go beyond open bag, push button, wait for time to be done. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, even, even, I mean, look at even in, in how food is created or cooked for most kids in schools these days. It's, you know, the, the favorite, the favorite tool of most school cafeterias or the most one, the one that's most widely used is the box cutter. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, I, and I get it. It's like, you know, we got schools in our area here. It's got 3,400 students, you know, feed those in three hours. You know, it's like, yeah. what are you going to do? Um, so back to your point, I think people are really gravitating to that. You're seeing a lot of people have been interested in like those kudu grills, you know, uh, more of the Brazilian style stuff, uh, fire tables. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things I like to always talk about with people, um, especially, you know, people that are in the, in the business, like we are is in the last 10 or 12 years, the amount of innovation that has been out there on these grills, um, it's just amazing to me, you know, you start putting in the Wi-Fi temp controllers and pellet grills and, you know, now you got the uh, master built's got the, the charcoal gravity fed for 500 bucks. I mean, it's not just the innovation, but also, you know, trying to get innovation in those, you know, lower price points that yeah. make it more affordable for people to actually, you know, you yeah. know, I got to, I got to come out of Joe out on my patio, but not a lot of people great, can afford a grill but not a lot of people can afford a thousand dollar grill on their patio. True enough. Uh, and they, there's plenty of people that go to home Depot and Lowe's and Walmart and go to their outdoor section and buy, you know, the stuff that you can find on Alibaba all day long. But even those grills are starting to get, you know, a little bit more different. Like I, I was looking today cause I'm, I'm going to shoot a video uh, for my pod or for my uh, YouTube channel talking about mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. And, one of them was like you said, the hasty bake. And one of the things I like about the hasty bake is that it's adjustable platform. Yeah. It's almost like an internal San Maria kind of deal. Exactly. Up and down. Yeah. That's been around since 1948, but now you'll see that in a lot of these cheaper grills that, you know, that you can get at Walmart or home Depot that some of these have that same type of, you know, Mm -hmm. concept that's been around for a long time, but now they're starting to innovate. What, What else can we do? You got all these different, you know, companies that are, what else can we do to make these grills and uh, outdoor cooking apparatus easier and, you know, uh, more excited, you know, for the people to go out and get them. Let's th- the flat top griddles is another thing in the last couple of years has really exploded. Yeah. Blackstone was Blackstone, big Camp and, yeah, Chef, the front of that. Camp Chef. Yep. You got char grillers got their own now. I mean, everybody's mm-hmm. coming out with one because they're getting so popular. Um, that outdoor space is getting, you know, I know cause I got five cookers out of my, you know, it gets crowded quick. It's starting to get crowded and they're all different. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I know just, it. Not I, know like it. I got five Weber kettles out there. I've got five totally different cookers out there. So yeah. Yeah. And what do you think that's going to, you know, do? I mean, 
I, I just every year. I, do you ever get to go to like the HB, you know, the home of her and Patty? I have not and, been, but I have several Craig Tabor, Chris Gentry, uh, some Josh Tahan. Yeah, you know, so you know, Craig has been around the, the, the grilling world for a long time. He is about to actually open up his own grill store outside of the Atlanta area. Um, but you know, he's he's been big in he is a pit master. He knows how to cook on pretty much everything. Gentry's got a store out of uh, Orlando, Florida, Gentry's barbecue. Um, and they're, uh, you know, he's killing it. He's a, you mentioned Wi-Fi, like the Yoder smokers, right? Like the built in, you know, everything, the, the temp control, the, the, the monitoring, the measurement. Um, and, and Josh Tahan deals with a lot with the, the uni, pizza ovens right so mm -hmm. all those guys have been at those, at those kind of events and i think and you're not kidding like everyone's trying to find the the magic sauce right that special mix of of what the customer wants and man grills especially pellet grills with all the internals and the measurement tools and it's like trucks right like back in the 1970s a truck was a truck now right. it's a cowboy cadillac Right now it's got all the bells and whistles and all the stuff and grills are starting to be that way to some extent as well. I've never gotten super excited about Wi-Fi and temp mapping. I don't need to look at the data of my last 20 cooks to, I don't need that. I'm out by the cooker because I like to cook, mm -hmm. you know, beer in hand. If I need to check the temperature, I'll have maybe a, a, a Thermoworks dot or something cheap. I mean, I'm, I've got, they've sent me other nicer units. I use that dot and I use that thermopop more than anything else, like the, the cheaper stuff. And uh, it's easy. Yeah. But what happens is, and I've seen this with some of the different brands, you know, you Green Mountain or Camp Chef, you know, they don't have a Wi-Fi, you know, unit. And then you got somebody like Rectech that comes out with one, you know, and it takes that them two years to develop their own they're like ah i guess i have to come out weber i mean you know they never had a pellet grill the pellet grill that's and right they felt compelled to come out with a pellet grill and with that pellet grill they wanted it to have the wi-fi and bluetooth so now instead of just a grill manufacturing company they have to have somebody develop the software for the app and mm -hmm. all kinds of electronics that they're not yeah. used to doing i mean well you mentioned master belt i mean yeah. geez louise like in and I had to say this real quick. Master Built's gravity fed units are sold at a price point that's affordable for most people. And you go on some of these forums and stuff and you see people who are like, ah, you know, you know, it, this one part is like, you know, starting to wear off or this one thing. It's like you, you didn't, you paid 500 bucks for this thing and exactly. it does a great job for a $500 grill. It does it does the work of at least a, a grill that's 7 or 800 bucks. I mean, they they put a lot of like 3 years of development into how this thing's going to map out and I don't know, man. I got I got a little patience for people that want to pick at stuff like that. Yeah, but you'll get crazy. that they'll buy a, you know, a $100 grill and they'll do the same thing. I mean, You're right. People will complain. I got people where, you know, I actually uh, I have this thing called the grill gun and you know, I, when it was under development, you know, I hooked up with the owner and I love the thing and it's a little pricey. It's over a hundred bucks, but the thing is it's got everything built into it and it's a high quality product. And I get people go, Oh, you can go to Harbor freight and get their weed burner. And it's the same thing for 30 bucks. It's like, it's okay. It does the same thing. It's like saying a Pinto is the same as a Mercedes Benz, you know, it's, That's right. <laughs> it's not, they, you know, they both drive, they both have right? wheels and they both drive, but it's, they're totally different things. And right. that's one of the, you're always going to get that. I mean, you get it yeah. in everything. You get that in cars, you get that in how you know, everything, you know, but barbecue, it's the same way. People will complain, you know, they will, the, the biggest people, the, you know, the branders, I hate the branders, you know, Big Green Egg is it? You know, I got, you know, uh, Kamado Joe socks. You know, it's the Ford versus Chevy people. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Traeger yeah, yeah. is the best grill in the world. You know, Look, I've seen Green cases. No, no, don't get me, Darren. I've seen cases where people have had brand names or or even hashtags tattooed on their bodies. I know, it's crazy. At that point, you may need to seek mental yeah. assistance. Like, go to a doctor and figure out why you made that life choice. Because <laughs> something's wrong. I like, I, I, you know, like I said before, I, I like 
all different kinds of cookers and yeah. I can, I can see, you know, the benefits and, and, you know, the, the, the bad things of everything, nothing's perfect. And I'm, I just, I love the people that go, you got to get, the, this is the only grill you can have. It's that's it. Nothing else. And it's like, man, yeah. wow. Do you do that same thing with food? I can only exactly. eat a hamburger with, you know, mayonnaise <laughs> on it. You know, it's, that's right. Uh, I'm just never been that way. And it just nope. blows my mind when people get that way. Well, Kevin, mm -hmm. it's been great having you on. I don't want to keep you all night. We could probably sit here and talk for another. We could. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time. If, if you can give me a second, I would like to kind of talk uh, to, uh, to some of my sponsors and, and show them a little love. Definitely have to talk with, uh, you know, with everyone here real quick about, the good work and the, the educational opportunities that are out there with barbecue champs academy barbecue champs.com those guys those classes are amazing some of the biggest and best names in uh in barbecue and steak grilling are out there uh definitely give them um a look see i'm actually having mike on uh monday we're gonna do it's great so he's gonna be on yep. my podcast yep. you'll love it that. it's awesome and it's it's all just he'll he'll Guys, look, if you've ever been to a class and you've had a hard time remembering everything that was told to you over the last couple of days of the class and you're like, oh, wait, my notes weren't good enough or I got distracted, you don't have that with any of these classes. They're very well priced, affordable, and uh, you can scroll through and go to each segment and find just what you need. If you miss something, it's, it's really great. Um, also, cookingpellets.com, Chris and those guys, I've used cooking pellets brand pellets for my pellet smokers for ever now i've had zero need to go anywhere else and they've been great friends of my show and i highly you know recommend you check them out amazon almost always has them on prime there's nothing like getting a 40 bag 40 pound bag of pellets shipped right to your door for free well shipping free uh and the price is right so check those out and then last but not least if you have cast iron anything that you cook on you got to you got to give some love to Crisby cast iron seasoning products it's a C R I S B E E uh Crisby puck on Instagram Instagram it's amazing they formulated a a blend of of all natural ingredients that you know do what you need to do to season and protect your cast iron stuff and I don't know, Darren, if you've ever messed around with trying to season cast iron and had I've bad actually experiences. Gotten, I, I've gotten rid of the cast iron grates on my commodity yeah. cookers because I just couldn't keep the rust off of them. So. Yeah, I'm t Crispy will save that from ever happening. Especially here amazing. in Florida because it's so humid all humid. the time. Humid, oh I, yeah. I, so I, I, I was actually telling somebody the other day that I stopped getting cast iron grates on any of my grills because it, in Florida it's just so humid. It's you tough. Can't, can't keep up with them, so. Yep. So yeah, just wanted to, to give a shout out to those guys. And then also, you know, podcast love, right? So the Pit Pastor podcast, guys, if you like barbecue, check out those guys. You know, Anthony and, and Rusty do a great job. Also, um, Smoking Hot Confessions out of Australia. Ben is just top notch, does great work. And and keep showing Darren here some love, guys. He's doing great work. Darren, I... I love, we didn't even really get to talk about it. When I have you on my show, I'm going to dig deeper into the sous vide world yeah, and how, and we can really expand. Cause I love what you're doing, bro. I love that you're, uh, you're helping people find new and, and interesting ways to impart flavors and textures and, and, and things to their food. So yeah, it's, it's been a blast. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Uh, I really appreciate you being on, but yeah, getting back to that though. And that's kind of what the brand people kind of reminds me of the people that say you can only eat barbecue if it's this way. I've never been somebody that locks myself into a cooking method. I love cooking barbecue, straight barbecue, but I also like experimenting with my yeah. cooking. And yeah. I, you know, I think that's how you grow and learn. That's why Absolutely. I like watching a lot of these food, you know, uh, shows on Netflix and stuff where mm -hmm. they go around the world and, and see how people yeah, like ugly delicious and all those shows. Yeah, how they can great. take chicken, yeah. they take chicken and they can cook it a million different ways and it'd yeah. be different. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I want people to understand. And you know, yeah, I think you have that in everything. Like I said, people get locked in. Yeah. You can only do something a certain way. And, and I've never been that way. And I like experimenting, exploring. And there's a lot of people out there like me and you that do the same thing. But thanks again, Kevin. I really appreciate it. And make sure everybody check out Barbecue Beat. The, the website, the podcast, the blog, and uh, give Kevin some love. He's been doing this a while. He's got some great, um, great episodes. He, he's uh, been around a lot longer than me, and hopefully I'll be on his podcast soon. You can, uh, he can pick my brain a little bit.
Thanks. Again, I love Kevin. to, I love to do it, man. Thanks so much. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. And, um, Make sure you follow us on the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast, YouTube channel, Facebook groups, and I'll see you on the next episode. I want to thank Kevin from uh, Barbecue Beat for being on. This episode has been brought to you by Fresh Jack's Organic Spices. Make sure you check them out in the link below. You can also check them out on, on my Amazon store. Fresh Jack's is some of the freshest, best spices you'll ever have. They have some great uh, seasoning blends, and they also have just the straight up spices that you can you can get from them check them out guys make sure you follow us on the fire and water cooking youtube channel facebook group and page and make sure you keep watching and following the fire and water cooking podcast see you on the next one